That clap was for the kids. Can we give a clap for our dads today? Yeah. <laughs> In fact, I'd like to pray for our dads today. Would you, would you bow with me? Um, uh, we pray for our, today for our dads, new dads, granddads, stepdads, adoptive dads, uh, solo dads, uh, baldy ones, beardy ones, skinny ones, cuddly ones, uh, dads who tell bad jokes, uh, dads who dance to YMCA, uh, dads who know how to fix things, and dads who just pretend to know how to fix things. Uh, Father, you are father to the fatherless, so we pray for those for whom this day is, is sadder than it is happy. Those who feel they failed, those who are grieving children they never had, those who are missing their dads or their children even more than usual. Father, in a, in a world where some dads can be distant or absent, we lean into your ever-present love. You are faithful, especially to those of us who are orphaned or abandoned and hurt. Your word tells us, even if my father abandons me, the Lord will hold me close. Father of comfort, I ask that you would heal any wounds that we have and restore dignity and integrity and the value of fatherhood in our culture. And finally, Lord, uh, for those poor souls everywhere who forgot that today is Father's Day, we ask that you bless them in your abundant grace and your manifold mercy with the discovery of a half-decent card in a surprisingly well-stocked convenience store. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> uh, we're in, uh, by the way, didn't Jonathan do a great job last Sunday? Uh, just that, that idea, do we lean towards rule-keeping or uh, making our own rules? Uh, we're continuing on in Galatians, and we're in chapter 3, and this is what it says, For you are all children of God through faith in Christ, and all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ, just like putting on clothes. There's no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham, you are his heirs, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. Think of it this way. If a father dies and leaves an inheritance for his young children, those children are not much better off than slaves until they grow up, even though they actually own everything their father had. They have to obey their guardians until they reach whatever age the father set. And that's the way it was with us before Christ came. We were like children. We were slaves to the basic spiritual principles of this world. But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. There's some words that uh, have kind of a weight and a meaning. Some words are, tend to be more gracious and some words tend to be less gracious. For example, the word receive just seems to be filled with, with grace and freedom to that. The word take, not so much. Take usually implies that uh, maybe some, some force or maybe some deception was used in order to get something. Huh. We live in a world where uh, there's a lot of taking that occurs. And the reason we do that is because we're afraid that there's not a lot to receive. That if, if we wait, wait to receive something, we'll actually be left out. When you look through scripture, though, it's really an interesting thing. All the stories where people lose freedom, it was because they were taking something. Back to the original story of humanity, Adam and Eve in the garden. They took of the fruit that was forbidden, and the result is they lost everything. 
Jesus refers to this great story. It's, it's probably one of his most famous parables about the prodigal son. And what he tells us about that prodigal son is that he went to his father and he took his inheritance and he went away to a far country and he squandered it. And he winds up losing everything. Taking doesn't lead to freedom. What's interesting is that when he thinks he's going to starve to death and, and he's willing to go back and work even as a servant in his father's estate, when he gets there, he receives his father's embrace, he receives his father's robe, he receives his father's shoes, he receives his father's ring. That that is the picture of grace and that is the picture of freedom. Freedom is from God. And the reason that we can trust freedom that comes from him is because he is free and he desires freedom for us. Someone who is not free cannot make you free. And so our culture seems to believe that, that you have more freedom or better freedom if you take something. Especially in American culture, where, where our nation is, is built on this idea that, that we, were, we were a colony and then we, we took matters into our own hands and we became a free nation. And so we, we tend to see freedom as something that's out there that we have to take. And the Apostle Paul wants us to understand that freedom is actually something that's already here and we just need to receive. A question. If freedom that is given to you, is that worth less to you than the freedom that you take? In our culture, that's, that's the common theme, I think. So the Apostle Paul wants us to understand this concept. So as is often in Scripture, a metaphor is used to help us understand and unpack it. And so there's a father and the father has died and he has left a will. And in the will, he has named his children and identified what inheritance is going to belong to them. Now, in the ancient culture, and quite honestly, in lots of places in our world, there were slaves and slaves don't have freedom. Children can have freedom, slaves do not. And when you have a, a way of thinking that is more like a, a, a slave, uh, your tendency is to develop either some apathy, because none of this matters. Uh, I'm not going to own anything. I, I'm not going to have anything. I'm not going to become anything. I'm, ju I'm just a slave. So there's apathy, or there's this furious fighting that you have to just go after everything so hard to get anything at all. And, and the Apostle Paul makes this stark contrast between children and slaves. And, and what he wants us to know is that there are some sons and daughters of God you're children of God, but you're still thinking like slaves. I have to earn something. I have to take something. I have to use my power, or none of it matters, and I don't care. So Paul impacts some statements here about freedom that I think is worth us taking a look at. And the first is this, is that freedom is found in relationship. Freedom is found in relationship. He uses the word children. When you talk about children, you don't know anything else about them. You don't know what their economic status is. You don't know their IQ. You don't know their competencies. You don't know their capabilities. You don't know their appearance. You don't know anything. Children is strictly, purely a relational word. That's all it is. It's a relational word. My children asked me one time if instead of calling me dad, they could call me by my first name. And... Uh, I was taken back by that a little bit, uh, but I did not do uh, uh, what, what I could have done as a dad. No, you refer to me as a dad, or you can find another house to live in. <laughs> it's not, not good. Uh, so this is what I told them. I said, there's only two people in the whole world that can call me dad. Anybody else can use my name. Only two people can use dad. And you're those two people. Well, that's a pretty special privilege, so I'm... I'm as far as I know, at least in their presence, I'm still dead. Uh, if we're not in relationship with God, if we're not his children, then there's not real freedom. Now, we might assume that freedom is just about having access to more choices, but the truth is, you will get more choices if you are away from your family and away from your friends. You will feel like you have more latitude, but is that really the definition of freedom? Freedom is connected to relationship. A second thing that Paul tells us is that freedom provides equality without destroying what makes you unique. Freedom provides equality without destroying what makes you unique. This is how he says it. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave, 
excuse me, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. In a family, children are equally loved, but that doesn't mean that they aren't different. I have two kids, they're very different. And uh, you, uh, you might wonder, how did that happen? You know, they're so different. How did that happen? And then there's differences in age, there's differences in abilities, there's, differences, there's all kinds of differences. And, and, and the truth is, is that parents, if you want to equally love your children, you cannot treat them the same. So, well, all the children should get to do the same thing just because they're children, okay? If that's true, then when one child turns 16 and the other child is 13, we have to wait until the second child turns 16 before the first child can drive. Is that fair? It's a real question. Is that fair? No, of course it's not. Parents have to treat their children differently because they love them equally. They're not the same age. They don't have the same capacities. They don't have the same temperaments. Like there has to be a distinction. And so for us, we will notice that God treats some of his children differently. It's not as though God is playing favorites. He never does. But he knows things about our temperaments, about our capacity, about our maturity. And so he, out of his equal love, has to do the thing that's best for us, not just do the same thing for us that he did for someone else. Does that make sense? Yeah. So there's this idea. Um, we don't need to feel threatened about competing for love. My sister used to sign all her cards to my parents. YFC stands for your favorite child. And I would just tell her, if you have to say it, it's probably not true. <laughs> We're not in competition to be loved. We don't have to fight for it. We don't have to earn it. We just have to receive it. A lot of times we're tempted to be like someone else. Maybe we like how they look or we like the attention that they get. So we start taking on some of their style, some of their persona. We might even have some things in common with them, but every single one of us is unique. You might have a family resemblance. You might even be an identical twin, but you're not the same. So, so the question is why, why do we have so much trouble accepting and being ourselves? I think humans are the only thing that do this. I don't think that there's a crow somewhere out in the world and say, I'm sick and tired of being a crow. I wish I was a dog. And I think humans are the only ones who struggle with this. And so when we start looking at people, well, we can start making assessments about and maybe even creating distance from or connection to based on things as simple as ethnicity, ethnicity and skin color, gender, uh, class, uh, these are all things that one of the great temptations of our society is that we believe the best friends we'll make are the people who are just like us. And some of the best friendships we could ever have in our lives are someone who's very different from us, but we tend to keep distance. Uh, the third thing I think uh, the apostle wants us to understand is that freedom reveals something about our worth. Uh, we all enjoy freedoms. Uh, and it's true, we might not have paid anything for that, but somebody did um, at great cost. That's true spiritually as well. There's, and in our world, uh, have you noticed there's always someone that looks better than you? Uh, there's always someone that knows more than you? Uh, there's always someone who has more than you? Um, we... <laughs> When we're around people who look better, have more, can do more, our tendency is to see ourselves as less. And that's very unfortunate because what we're doing is we're building our worth on what we can do or how we look. And rather than building our worth on what we have done, the gospel tells us our worth is established by what God has done for us. You wanna know what you're worth to God? Your worth is one and only son. That's how much you are worth to God. When, when we try to make ourselves worthy to others, we try to make ourselves indispensable, we work really hard to do what? To earn that. 
See, that's the point. We keep trying to fight for so we can take something, earn something, and it's not real freedom because someone else comes along and they can do it a little bit better. Now what happened to you? And so Paul says, we need to work this out. Our worth is established by what God has done for us. There are some, I've seen this. I've, I have seen people who have a really good skill, a really good capacity, and they will hide it because they are worried that someone could criticize them for it or think that they're trying to be too smart or too talented or too whatever. And so they'll hide. Is that freedom to have to hide your strengths? There are some people who have weaknesses, and we don't want people to know what we're not good at. And so we stay quiet or make stuff up, and, and we pretend. Is that real freedom to have to pretend? Jesus has come to make us free, to make us children of the living God. And if we keep trying to earn it, if we keep trying to fight for it, if we keep trying to take it, then we'll always feel left out. That moment will come. Is that really freedom? Look at what he says. We were like children. We were slaves to the basic spiritual principles of the world. But when the right time came, God sent his son born of a woman subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. In the ancient world, you could actually pay the price and redeem a slave. And here's what would happen. If, that, if you ever paid that price for a slave, no one was ever permitted to enslave that person again. Christ has paid the price and has redeemed us from slavery. How many are glad about that? No one can make you a slave again. Nobody. In, in, in the ancient world and in lots of places in our world, slaves or servants are only useful for what their capabilities and what work they can accomplish. Uh, that's why they're treated as a commodity, like a tool that you own. And their only value is the work that they can do. In Christ, we are shown what our value is. Christ paid the price with his one and only life. You are a child of God. You are no longer a slave. And it's because of what Christ has done for us. The, the fourth thing that I think that Paul focuses on here is that freedom leads to family intimacy. Freedom leads to family intimacy. This is what he says. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. The, the earliest syllables in, in our culture, it would be ma, 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 or da, 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 da. And, and if you're pretty normal, there's a competition going out in the house, going on in the house to find out which one they're going to call first. And when the, when the other parent is not around, we look at them in the face and we go, da, 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 da. <laughs> and, and the language that Paul is writing in, Abba, 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 Abba. That, it's, it's just da, da. That's what it means. Do you know what's interesting is that Jesus always addressed God as Father. And in fact, he calls us to do the same when he teaches us to pray. Is this not the Lord's prayer? Our Father, our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Do you know what's really interesting? There's not another religion in the world, not another religion in the world that teaches people to see God as Father. Lots of titles, all a steward, very high, most high, great creator. All of those titles are true of God, they're not wrong, they're just not intimate. My, uh, we have a, a 10 month old uh, granddaughter and a six year old granddaughter. Last week was a big week. Uh, our six year old is losing teeth and our 10 month old is getting teeth. <laughs> so. But the 10 month old, uh, when she's frustrated, she'll go, mama, 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 mama. She wants mama to fix something. And when she wants a bottle, she goes, ba, 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 ba. And when she's frustrated and she wants a bottle, she'll go, ma, ba, ma, ba. <laughs> yeah. Only Christianity invites us into that kind of intimacy 
And there's great freedom in it. Great freedom. You are not just invited to see God as holy and high and lifted up. You are invited to see him as your father. You have the intimate right to approach him any time you want, to say anything you want, to ask for anything you want. We are free to be spontaneous and uninhibited before God. Aren't you glad that God is just not some high force in power that we have to constantly act like we're afraid? He's our father. And, and the, the last point that, that Paul makes is this, is that freedom is available now. Freedom is available now. Look at what he says. When the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out Abba, Father. Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are God's child, God has made you his heir. When God sent Jesus to the earth, it was freedom time. That's what he came to do, to bring freedom to us. There's a lot of us, we're stuck in the past. Maybe there's some wounds, some hurts, some disappointments, some betrayals, and we're kind of trapped back there. We relive those moments over and over again in our minds. We have a hard time living in the present. We can't think much about the future. And for some of us, uh, the way we live in the past is through our traditions and, 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 and through nostalgia. Uh, we just like things done a certain way. And, uh, and when, when things are done that way, it just makes us feel good on the inside. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's good. Unless, unless that's the only feeling you allow yourself. If it always has to be like this, so I feel like this. Uh, we can learn from the past, but we can't live in the past. You were created to live, not relive. We need to think about that. Sometimes we avoid or refuse what could be the most amazing things in our lives because it doesn't feel like something or look like something that we really liked from the past. And, and a lot of people, they'll focus on the future future hopes, future dreams. And, and that can be good. It gives us a sense of hope. It can give us a sense of purpose. All of those things are true. But it's also true that the future can be an escape from reality. A lot of people only focus on the future as though when that finally happens, then I will finally have or then I will finally be. And that's not how it's supposed to be. An escape or a fantasy world is no way to live in the real world. Freedom is available now. I, I will ask the worship team to come out. God gave his son. That's the basis of being a child of God. Listen to how the, the apostle John would write about it in his gospel. To all who did receive him, there's that freedom word, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent or human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. To those who received. We don't earn it. We can't take it. We believe. We receive. God sent his son into our world, and if we receive him, we're his child. But for some of us, that sounds good, but doesn't feel real. So Paul tells us what that next part is. God sent his son into our world to redeem us, but God also sends his spirit into our heart. And that's what causes us to release the words, Abba. It makes it personal, it makes it intimate. So well, how do I get that? It's not by taking, it's not by earning. It's by receiving what God has already provided. Jesus came into our world, and Jesus lived a perfect life, and Jesus reflected his Father's heart, and Jesus died for our sins, and Jesus rose from the dead. And that truth makes you a child of God. But some of us in this room, it doesn't feel like family, and it doesn't feel real to us yet. 
And so the Holy Spirit is also a gift from God, not just into the world, but into your heart. And what happens? All of a sudden, instead of just a truth on a page, he comes the Father. Have you ever seen a little child do this? They, uh, especially when they're toddlers, they'll go. What does that mean? Pick me up. I'm tired of carrying my own weight. <laughs> I need help. A child just trusts. That's all they have to do. Hands up. There's someone right there who will take care of me. They'll pick me up. They'll hold me. They'll hug me. They'll give me what I need. They'll take care of me. What's the word that comes out of the child's mouth? Da, 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 da. Ma, 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 ma. In, in the Old Testament, there's this great story. You probably have heard it. It's one of the more famous ones. There's, there's three Hebrew young men, and because they won't bow down to an idol and worship it, they're thrown into a fiery furnace. It's, it's, that's overkill, but that's the way it was back then. And, and it tells us that in that fiery furnace, two things. One is, as they were bound before they were thrown in and, and their hands were all tied and their feet were tied. And the only thing that burned in the fire was, was the cords that held them. And that there actually was a fourth man in the fire with them and it was the Son of God. I wonder, I wonder. I wonder what's keeping your hands and your feet bound so that you're unable to raise your hands and say, Father, Dada, because he's that real and he's that close and he cares that much. Let's bow our heads this morning. Father, would you help us just burn off anything that holds us back from trusting that if we raise our hands, you are there to help us. We are free because of what you have done for us. We are your children. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together this morning.